We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to the Archaeology Show. TAS goes behind the headlines to bring you the real stories about archaeology and the history around us. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Podcast, Episode 77. I'm Chris Webster. And I'm April Camp Whitaker. On today's show, we talk about a new book called Born a Slave, Died a Pioneer, Nathan Harrison and the Historical Archaeology of a Legend, written by Seth Malios. Let's dig a little deeper. Dr. Seth Malios is professor of anthropology, university history curator, and director of the South Coastal Information Center at San Diego State University. An archaeologist, anthropologist, and historian, Professor Malios received his BA from the University of California, Berkeley, and his MA and PhD from the University of Virginia. Dr. Malios previously served as site supervisor at the 1607 James Fort Archaeological Site in Jamestown, Virginia, the first permanent English settlement in the Americas. Since moving to San Diego in 2001, Professor Malios has spearheaded six research projects, the San Diego Gravestone Project, the Lost Murals of San Diego State Project, the Nathan Nate Harrison Historical Archaeology Project, the Whaley House Historical Archaeology Project, the San Diego Archaeological Geographic Information System, and the Historical Archaeology of Local Rock and Roll. Dr. Melios has published 10 books, dozens of articles, and garnered nearly 2 million in over 80 extramural grants, contracts, and awards. All right, welcome to the show, everyone. April, I feel like we haven't done this in a little while. How are you doing? Uh, you know, it is crazy, but good. And I'm really <laughs> excited about the show. I absolutely devoured this book. So, yeah. I mean, it's historical archaeology, it's my wheelhouse, and it read. Like this fascinating, almost mystery. Well, there you go, and it's good because we're gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna preface this with a little bit of history I just learned yesterday as we're recording this. Uh, well, first off, I have to acknowledge this month is the five year anniversary of the Archaeology Podcast Network. So, please go out and share anything you want. You use hashtag APN five, and uh, you know, put up some pictures or something like that. If you're a member, if you have stickers, if you have swag, put up some pictures. Let us know that you you're listening to the show and uh, and supporting us for these uh, for these last five years. We put up over two thousand. 500 episodes of various podcasts in that five years. <laughs> so, that's... so that's, that's one bit of recent history. The other one is I just found out I'm related to an early governor, uh, one of my first ancestors to come over from England, apparently on my grandfather's side, my dad's side. And then my, you know, his grand, his dad um, was John Webster was an early governor of Connecticut when they came over from England, had nine children. And I'm pretty sure with nine children being the first Webster that we're aware of to come over here, probably spawned all the other websters in the country. <laughs> so, at least a, a decent chunk of them. Yeah. I know. I know. Right. And, and we're officially related to uh, Noah Webster, I guess, through that line and Johnny Carson and Emily Dickinson of all people and both Bush presidents and Rutherford B. Hayes somehow. So that's a, uh, that's a little bit of historical archaeology for you right there. But Today, as I mentioned in the introduction and the bio, we are talking to Dr. Seth Malios. Seth, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. All right. So why don't you, we're going to talk about your book, Born a Slave, Died a Pioneer. And I mentioned that in the uh, in the introduction, of course, uh, and Nathan Harrison. But I did want to mention too, this sounded so familiar when I saw the book title and I had to go back and do some searching, some pretty hardcore searching because I didn't write very good show notes. But on the CRM Archaeology Podcast, episode 133, which we will link to in the show notes, I interviewed at the Society for California Archaeology meeting in 2018 in San Diego, California, uh, Vicki Morgan, who is the... <laughs> owner of the Harrison Serenity Ranch, or at least was when I interviewed her. <laughs> she still is, yeah. She still is. So we'll talk about what that means here in a second, but why don't you give us your background, uh, and then we'll start talking about the uh, the book and Nate Harrison. So I'm a historical archaeologist, and I went to college at Cal. I had a great experience there, and then went to grad school at the University of Virginia. And my advisor was Jim Dietz, and he inspired me in all things anthropology, archaeology, and history. And after finishing up my doctorate there, I went to work at Jamestown on the Jamestown Rediscovery Project. Nice. And that was a fantastic experience being, being able to be part of you know, the team that found the 1607 fort and the start of English America. And 
then all this ties together in that Jim Dietz passed away in 2000. And I realized that although I love the Jamestown project and I love the friends who were like family out there for me, I wasn't teaching. Um, I was just mm-hmm. digging. And Jim was such a fantastic teacher. And I realized that I, that I should be given back. And so I, I went on the job market and there was a job at San Diego State. And I'm from California originally. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> uh, and so I applied for the job and was definitely a long shot because they wanted somebody who specialized in San Diego historical archaeology. <laughs> uh, and that that was not in my wheelhouse. But I started doing some preliminary research. And if you can believe it, I got excited about finding more information on the historical archaeology of Nathan Harrison because mm-hmm. I, I wanted to find in my mind, what was the most fascinating American story in the region. And I didn't need it to be the earliest. You know, it, when we were working at Jamestown, there was such a focus on first, famous first. And while that's great, I, I don't think that's a prerequisite for importance or significance in sites. Um, I wanted there to be a theme. I wanted there to be something about a story that was distinctively American and distinctively engaging. And I just got pulled into the Nathan Harrison story of Mm -hmm. overcoming insurmountable obstacles. And so I actually talked about the Nathan Harrison site at my job interview. And (laughs) there were a lot of scrunched up faces because the folks couldn't believe that I, I, you're not going to dig the Presidio or the missions, you know, your historical <laughs> archaeologist, isn't, isn't that what you do? Right. Um, and, and, and especially, you know, was there African-American history in San Diego? Uh, it was, it was kind of a Ron Burgundy moment, you know, <laughs> where you're, <laughs> you're, you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm going to try and go a little deeper than what's, what's usually uh, going on. And, and I just got pulled into the story. I, I lucked out and they offered me the job. Uh, it was it was very tough to leave Jamestown, but at the same time, there is a, a real joy in being able to direct your own project and deal with all of the the ups and downs of that. Um, mm-hmm. And so so that's how it all started. And, and what stuns me is I've been in San Diego now for almost twenty years, mm-hmm. and you know this yeah. is my home. And and we've started a bunch of great projects from inventorying all the old cemeteries to finding old WPA era murals. Um, digging the old Whaley House well and privy, but but this one, the the Harrison project, means so much to me because it it, it really has been a, a twenty year project. Wow, that's crazy. So what you're saying is, in twenty years, you haven't experienced the temperature that was plus or minus seventy degrees, <laughs> it, five, it was, five degrees. Yeah, <laughs> it was wild because I, I went back to New York uh, in November. I I moved out in August and I went back to New York in November, and that's you know that's mm-hmm. all of three months. Yeah, and you'd have thought like the North Pole had taken over New York by the way I was acting. I was like, so cold. Uh, yeah, it, it takes about yeah. 10 minutes to get really soft here in San Diego. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, uh, Nathan Harrison? I mean, I know this is a relatively short podcast given the amazing life that he lived and the, and the extensive story that he's gotten. And, and I mean, just the the longevity of his life alone. And then the experiences from, you know, from when he was born to, to when and where he died. Why don't you give us a uh, kind of a high level overview of his life and his journey to San Diego? And then we'll dive a little deeper into it after that. Yeah. So he was born in Kentucky in the 1830s and born into slavery. And then he was taken across the country for the gold rush uh, in the 1840s, uh, ends up in, in Northern California in Santa Clara County, which at that time extends all the way into Motherload country. Um, uh-huh. And then spent some time there in the gold rush. And then the, the records aren't great and the stories are, are all over the place, but it appears that his owner passes away and he starts to migrate southward, as a lot of African-Americans did, uh, thinking that they would find better conditions in Southern California and Northern California. And it, it wasn't better. Because of settlement patterns, mm-hmm. uh, Northerners settled Northern California and Southerners settled Southern California. Oh, my. And so unbeknownst to him, he was walking right into an area that was very secessionist during the Civil War that had sundown towns, had some of the, the greatest amount of discrimination and violence towards ethnic minorities. And yet you hit it on it at the, at the intro. The special thing about this is he lives into his 90s. And so that key wow. question is how in the world did somebody, the average you know, age for former slaves who 
male and we're in the gold rush was around 30 years and he lives three times that. And that's a key part of this story is how was he able to overcome all these obstacles and become so beloved by the local community? Um, and- I can't, I, I can't imagine most non, uh, non-white people or I'm sorry, uh, most, uh, you know, white people and, and non-slaves lived into their nineties either. <laughs> right. And and, yeah. and then you consider he's living in a, a one room cabin up on top of this mountain right. that gets the most snowfall in the region. I mean, this is, this is very, this is very rustic. Uh, that's a nice word for it. Very difficult conditions. <laughs> and he really prospers. Um, and, and so, you know, the, one of the fun things about this project is it, is it combines both the, the, exciting moments in history with everyday life. And that's where with my own career, you know, Jim Dietz was all about everyday life. And then Bill Kelso and Noel Hume and the folks at Jamestown, this was all about these signature events. Um, And so we got to tackle both of these with this story, uh, trying to figure out, okay, how did he make do in such difficult conditions? And at the same time, why do the different stories place him at every important Southern California event in history? Um, he ends up being the, the Forrest Gump of Southern California. If there's a famous <laughs> event in, in Southern California, there's Nathan Harrison. And, and it's, it's, nice. com- it's completely untrue and outrageous. But the important thing is that people believed it and kept telling these stories. Yeah. Well, and this is something that struck me in the beginning of the book, especially is just, you work through all of the different stories about Harrison, sort of how he got there, who he was, what he did, what he didn't do, what was possible. And it ends up reading like this sort of detective story. You've got all these different narratives about one man and you're working through which ones can be true, which ones aren't. And it it was absolutely fascinating. Can you talk to us a little bit more about sort of this process of, of unraveling that you have to go through? First of all, thank you. Uh, to know that, that you <laughs> grip the material. It, it's, it's a very dense book because I felt that we had to wade through all of this writer and reader together. That, that if I just started with the conclusion, I felt like that wouldn't really do justice to this story because there's so many different stories and we had to find out, okay, why were these stories told in this way? Which ones are we certain we can disprove? And why did certain stories gain such traction? Um, and that's where it, it felt like a, a detective process in terms of wanting to eliminate certain options. The, the big irony is, is that when I was studying for that job interview 20 years ago, I got some information from a website. And it turns out now that I know, this is the Historical, Center web, the Historical Society website, that all that information was untrue. <laughs> that they, they, in fact, were buying into one of the false narratives. One, one of the things I go in depth into is that an entirely new narrative for Nathan Harrison emerges in the 1950s. 30 years after he passes, this new story comes out, and it is completely false and used for political purposes, used for a very conservative politician to win an election. It's actually the, the grandson of is claiming that his grandfather owned Nate Harrison and brought him out. And so part of, part of the research was debunking that and showing that this ultra conservative politician who voted against every equal rights act that was out there got elected on the premise that he's so old time San Diego that his grandfather owned Nathan Harrison. Wow. And, and that's where, you know, the, what I've come to learn in, in doing historical archaeology for about, I guess, 30 years now, is that a lot of these projects, you start by saying it's just about the past, and then soon you realize, oh, it's just as much about the distant past and the near past and the present, and you even see future plans in, in impacting all this. I think is interesting is as a historical archaeologist, I mean, so much of what we do is take these existing narratives about a person, a place, a historical event, and then sort of interrogate them from a different perspective. But very rarely does a book break down that process and actually stop and say, okay, here are all of the different stories and events and possibilities. Now let's line them up with the facts. And so I thought that was really interesting. You know, there's such a discussion about publishing 
negative data almost. Yeah, yeah. And in a weird way, that's what you've done. You've published the negative data. You've said, okay, here's the options, what's lining up. So I'm just raving a little bit. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. And for me, what was so exciting was going in, I, I, I'm used to where the archaeology can help settle a debate between two contradictory sources. But this this got so much bigger because we have over 100 different accounts. And what I started to see was this notion that all of them may be way off, that that none of them realized that that key punchline to the story that he was putting on an act for his visitors. And so th- this really changed my thinking as I was trying to be so explicit and take the reader with me through these steps of evaluating each of the sources. I came up with this this new thought is, well, wait a second. What if they're all wrong? Instead of, you know, trying to pick the best option between uh, a binary debate, what what if what if everybody's missed the boat and what if that historical actor what if if Harrison himself was deliberately misleading people and and that's where for me you know finding all those fired rifle cartridges on the ground finding the sharpened pencil lead finding these this evidence of self armament and literacy when every single source said he wasn't armed and it was against the law to be armed. And all the census records said he wasn't literate. That's when, you know, that was the aha moment of this detective novel. And I hope I'm not blowing the book for anybody. But but that was this, this key <laughs> moment where I thought, holy cow. You know, and, 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 and it wasn't subtle at all in the ground. It, was, it, it, it blew me away because it was so subtle in terms of the historical accounts. But archaeologically, you know, when you have hundreds and hundreds of fired rifle cartridges, and they're all the same caliber and, you know, and they're all the same time period. Uh, you, you get to, I mean, that's part of the fun of archeology span is seeing those patterns so clearly mm-hmm. in the ground. Well, I think that's a perfect moment to step back and take a break. And then when we come back, we can kind of investigate more of this idea of men's story and navigating this really racialized past, because I think that's a yeah. very interesting central message. So we will hop off to break and come back and talk about those issues. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30 percent off your first three months or go to z-e-n-c-a-s-t-r dot com and use the code t-a-s looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field then check out an introduction to paleo radiography a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines created by archaeologist radiographer and lecturer james elliott the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education it is approved by the chartered institute for archaeologists as four hours of training that's in the uk for those of you that don't know so don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development for more information on pricing and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. All right. Well, welcome back. We're talking with Seth Malios today. And we ended off our last section talking about these issues of minstrelry, which is a really interesting concept. And if you wouldn't mind defining it, Seth, and kind of explaining a little bit what this means and about sort of the agency of Harrison. Yeah. There's this huge irony in the story in that the, the minstrel act is all about playing the fool. And it's a, it's a tactic that's been used by different disempowered groups, especially African-Americans in the, in the South. um, And also the, the period after the civil war Uh, it's, it's tough because we, we like to hear about history that, that everything after the Civil War was about progress and gains for African Americans. And yet that was one of the worst times for African Americans in the nation's history. Uh, there are more lynchings after the Civil War in the period right after the Civil War than before the Civil War. And in terms of different legislation and different behaviors. And so different groups 
took on different survival strategies. And one of these was this self-deprecating act where people play the fool. And it, it, it's something that gets very widespread. And, and by the 1870s and 80s, every town in America has a minstrel act. Now, in some cases, it's white people uh, face painting and dressing up as black people and, and being buffoonish. And in other occasions, it's black people playing this act, acting buffoonish. Uh, and the, the biggest irony of all is that Uncle Tom's Cabin serves as this, as this set for it. If you read Uncle Tom's Cabin, Uncle Tom is the hero. He's a Christ figure. And yet in a very short time after it's published, it gets used politically and twisted into something it was never intended to be. Suddenly, Uncle Tom becomes this, this subservient toady. He's, he has no redeeming qualities. And, and that's, that's really at the backbone of this self-deprecating behavior, even though it's, it's not what Harriet Beecher Stowe intended at all. And tying it to, to Nathan Harrison, where this gets so fascinating, is Harrison employs a minstrel act for visitors that come up the mountain. He puts on his oldest clothes. Uh, there are accounts by his friends that when he heard people coming, he would immediately find his, his most torn up clothing. And he immediately starts speaking in the most fractured Southern dialect. And then he introduces himself with the big racial epithet. He says, I'm N-word Nate, the first white man on the mountain. And this is where, I mean, this, this concept is so volatile. And it's, it's one of the things that pulled me into this study so deeply because there's no getting away from the heavy racialized environment and the impact on society today. You, you can't avoid race at all, nor should you in this discussion of Harrison, because he uses the N-word and he uses it in this way that immediately disarms people. Take a moment. You know, he uses alliteration. He uses the word on himself. And then he immediately does this reversal and says, I'm the first white man on the mountain. And it, it's such an amazing phrase because he puts people at ease. He makes them laugh. He gives them this very memorable alliteration. And then at the same time, he throws in there, I'm the first white man on the mountain, emphasizing first, meaning that he has a right to be there. He's a pioneer. Uh, you know, he owns the property. And then by calling himself white, he very cleverly tells everybody, I'm not Native American. And in terms of the race dynamics of the time, that is a huge move to say, I'm part of the dominant population. Uh, it, it's such a loaded phrase. Uh, and and it was, it's, it's something that it's, it's hard to unpack because it's so dense. Um, but this is, this is part of the secret of his survival strategy. You know, he does own a rifle. We have evidence for that all over the site. And yet, in none of the photos is that rifle showcased. And this is such an important thing that he is presenting an image to the public that makes them feel safe, that makes them feel guilt-free. All these white people come up the mountain to visit him, and he gives them a little taste of the Annabelle himself. And he, he laughs with them. He tells them stories. In a way, they, they feel forgiven for, for all the atrocities of, of slavery in the Civil War. And yet the whole time he's doing this, this is just an act. Because when we started digging deeper, both through the archives and the archaeology, we saw this double life that he led. Um, he was married to, at different times, two different indigenous women. He gets baptized and he's adopted by the local tribe. His godparents are the tribal leaders. He's, he speaks the Luiseno dialect. He's, he's part of their community. And they even give him a different name. And this is what's amazing is we see this entirely separate set of documents that's all about Inez Harrison. And you learn mm -hmm. as you start to peel apart the layers, Inez Harrison and Nathan Harrison, that was the dual life of one individual. Um, and and one, of the, one of the best parallels for this, why, why we can see how successful this minstrel act was, is there's an amazingly similar individual named John Ballard who settles in Malibu, a former Kentucky slave, uh, come, is, is brought to California during the gold rush, homesteads land in Malibu. So, so, so many parallels with Nathan Harrison, except he doesn't do a minstrel act. He, he's not self-deprecating. He doesn't use the N-word on himself. He's nobody's fool. And the local residents in Malibu burn him off his property. 
Hmm. You know, and, and that's where you that's where you realize that even though California is taught California history is taught as this where it's a free state and it's this land of racial harmony. Yeah. That, that that is just complete crap in terms of the genocide against the Native American population, in terms of all the sundown towns and lynchings that were going on. All you have to do is is walk around Los Angeles and San Diego and you will see a stunning number of Southern Confederate hero monuments. Yeah, uh, which, which is really striking when you think about the fact that, you know, Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, they never visited California <laughs> for, for there to be monuments here to those folks in the city cemetery. Something else needs to be going on. And so yeah. th- that's where this all came together. And and I wish I could tell you at the start of this research that I had this all figured out and I was just, you know, hypothesis testing. No way. The the reason the book reads like a detective novel is that it was this learning process. It was this evolution that just, you know, every question we answered also opened 10 new questions. Do we know um, what his, uh, what Nate Harrison's end game was? Like what his agenda was? Did he have one or is he just, you know, was he tired of his early life as a, as a slave and just kind of messing with people? <laughs> I mean, what was his, what was his deal? <laughs> and, and, and this is where, you know, it's important to realize his agency in all this. Um, you know, it, it's so easy to treat him as, as passive, as, as, you know, that he's in all these photos and it's easy to think of him as the object of the photos instead of realizing, well, he got to choose whether or not to be in these photos his mm-hmm. best friend, Robert Asher, was often the photographer. He got to choose his clothing, choose the pose, choose the props. And so that, that question about Endgame is a fantastic one because it really turns the tables on, you know, a disempowered individual suddenly being seen as, as very empowered because he was a great storyteller and he loved to pull people's leg. And he would tell them sensationalized stories. You know, he... he he had a great sense of humor and that was part of his shtick. But what gets so fascinating is that he wouldn't talk about his time as a slave. And that's, I, I think, you know, I can't hmm. answer that question about what his end game was definitively, but I think we have these clues. And so if he's avoiding that whole time period, it's, it's not because, you know, he's, he's, he's not, he's not telling the whole story. Uh, and and so that's where you realize, oh no no, th- this is part of something that's very strategic. You know, he he sees what happens to people who look like him and sound like him, and he knows the the importance of having allies at all times. And and when you look at his friends, it's fascinating because you can make a diagram, and you see the people that he was closest to, the Native American population. Spanish and Mexican ranchers, different Jewish founders. And you see that he befriends a lot of these disempowered groups. And then he puts on a show for the traditional white Anglo-Saxon Protestants that come up the mountain. And that's where, you know, I, I don't want to to overplay his, his agenda, but the more ways I look at this, the more I see this is a very calculating individual who was very effective in this minstrel act. So keeping that in mind, do you think that uh, Nate Harrison himself was the, like it, your personal opinion on this, or maybe there's documentation of this, I don't know, but do you think he was maybe the source of a lot of these myths in, a, in an attempt to dissociate himself from his past and possibly even his his present in the, basically the, the south of <laughs> San Diego? Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. So folks called it during the civil rights movement, they called San Diego the Selma of the West. Um, so that, that's, that's no exaggeration. And, and to answer your question simply, yes. Um, and, and that's where, I mean, I, when you read through all the famous myths about Harrison, I mean, it it is amazing. It's, it's every important military battle in the region he's alleged to participate in. And, and this one is so powerful because it works on multiple levels. One is it gives him great antiquity. You know, if, if he's there when the, the Mormon battalion march comes to town, if he's there during uh, the Spanish-American War, that puts him in San Diego very early on in the 1840s, which is not true. But again, it, it you know, no one knows if 
how how much longer you were there before them. They just know you right. were there before them. And so he he again that that antiquity in the area is very important for him having permanence and a right to the land. The second thing is is throughout history disempowered groups have gained equality through military service. So there's it's not an accident claiming or passing on a story that you were part of the military because that is a great way to be accepted um, by the dominant group. Um, very powerful, especially when, you know, when you're on the winning side, uh, that's something mm-hmm. that, that really works for his story. And then there are even things that, that just blow me away. Cause there, there are a few stories about him escaping slavery in the identical way that Jim escapes slavery in Huck Finn. And so you have this, I mean, this is where like the, the, the layers of legends just start to compress themselves. Ernest Hemingway says that, that all American fiction comes out of Mark Twain. And I'm a firm believer now that, well, it seems like American nonfiction seems to come out of Mark Twain as well, because these were the stories that were being passed on as the truth about Nathan yeah. Harrison. And that's, you know, the, the fun for me with this book is I designed it to have three chapters, to have one on history, one on myth making, and one on archaeology. And the big irony is the history chapter spends all this time about things that aren't true. You know, where, where you thought you'd get the facts. It's all about all of this untrue history. And then the myth making where you expected to see all the fantastical stuff, you actually learn about some truths about why these stories were told. And then the archaeology, which was supposed to solve everything for us because we, we love archaeology so much, it ends up just bringing up all sorts of new things to investigate. <laughs> As it does. Yeah. One of the things that struck me is just, I mean, the power of using myth and story to sort of navigate in this highly racialized world. Also, you do a really interesting job of detailing how these myths and narrative change over time, um, both the ones that he's choosing to propagate, but also the ones generated by others. And one of the things that caught me, and I, it wasn't filled out quite as much in the book as I think I'm sure you personally know, is why locally Harrison became such a figure and why even in the 1950s, these myths about this single person are so important for local history and like local senses of their own self, right? Like local identity is weirdly tied to this yeah. one historical figure. Yeah. And this is, this is where part of this story was also about the local presentations I was making early on in the project, because I, I believe so much in, in public history and community history and public archeology. span I wanted to show people what we were finding, get folks involved and hear their take on the story. And, and always remember that I'm new to San Diego and that the real, the real stories that I want to learn are, are from people in the audience. And that's where I got to see how this story still matters to folks. And, and I wanted to track it because I saw in the 1950s, especially this split where simultaneously, and this blew me away. I didn't see this coming at all simultaneously, you have the most racist, disempowered stories of Harrison show up and the most empowered, heroic stories of Harrison, none of which are true. But, you know, it, it's, it's like something happens in the 1950s where both sides decide, hey, this is the story we want to run with. And, and that's where this becomes about San Diego, you know, during the civil rights movement. And the tension that was just inherent to a region that on the one hand is coastal California and fairly liberal, but on the other hand was settled by Southerners and has had all sorts of serious race issues for for over a century. And so what I did, and this is because I am just such an archaeologist at heart. I decided we needed to seriate the stories. I decided that stories are artifacts too. And so, you know, I broke out my little grid with lots of X's and pluses and minuses because I wanted to track exactly where these changes were happening and why they were, were happening. Um, because I, I believe that stories are material culture. Hey, I believe everything's material culture when it comes right down to it. And, and then I also wanted to acknowledge my own role in this because my decision to dig this site immediately says the site's important. 
you know, as archaeologists, we have some power. We get to choose what to dig and what not to dig. And when we say we're going to spend time and resources um, on this project, we're suddenly making our statement that this is important. And so I, I had to reconcile all those things going on. Harrison's role in his own myth making, these political groups with their own totally opposite agendas, and then my own role as, as an archaeologist. And that's where, you know, to try and keep track of all of this, I, I really tried to grit it out and figure it out. But it, it's, it's so tough for me to balance the local nuances and then what's going on at this, at this broader level, at the national level. And that's where, you know, I, I'm a fan of allowing multiple interpretations to happen at the same time. I, I don't believe that there's one answer for what something means or why somebody did something. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to have it all play out together because people are also complicated. Nate Harrison was incredibly complicated. And everybody that tells his story, that, that, is, a, that is a big tangled web as well. And, and at times, I also got to see simplicity into, into it. I, I'll tell you, at just about every talk that I give, and I've given over 100 of these talks, some old white guy will pull me aside at the end of the talk and say, hey, you know what he used to call himself, don't you? And there's this, this kind of titillation because he, he really wants to say the N-word and he knows I don't say the N-word. And, and it's, it's this generational thing and it's a racialized thing. And that's when I realized, oh, this is all still being played out. You know, it's, it's easy to, to, you know, to feel like we get to wear a lab coat and just study this. But no, it's all playing out right in front of us. All right. Well, that is a good point to take our final break and then to come up and wrap up the discussion with Dr. Seth Malios about the life and times of Nathan Harrison. Back in a second. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun t-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. Welcome back to the Archaeology Show, and we were finishing up this discussion with Dr. Seth Malios. And, you know, this podcast is in three segments, so it seems appropriate for me to ask this question here because your book is it basically in three chapters <laughs> to go into the archaeology. And you mentioned just the the amazing amount of artifacts you found um, during the dig um, at the Nathan Harrison site. And I'm wondering, and I was wondering this back in the first segment when we uh, I sort of lost communication with you guys because of the power of the internet, is uh, with all these myths surrounding Nathan Harrison, are there any that uh, that you were able to either prove or disprove with the archaeology, and and really the biggest thing is, are there any still left that you weren't able to tackle? Are there any that you're not sure if either he made them up or somebody else made yeah. them up, and they're still persisting and being told by people? Yeah, so I, it's a great question, and and it's something that's always on our mind when we're digging. You know, is is there's the broad pattern of artifacts, but then there are these isolated artifacts that, that you hope can answer a very specific question. Um, I think the ones that they did a great job of answering get into some of these racialized stereotypes, especially those that emphasize, I mean, there's some of them that are nasty that talk about the, the lazy black man and just living, you know, living off of others. And that's where we got to see a, a lot of different uh, lines of evidence about cottage industries there. Yeah. Um, in terms of all the different horse hardware, uh, we definitely see that he was skilled at, at raising horses and that was part of his income. He was a shepherd and we see that he was, you know, on the basis of 8,000 sheep bones, he was only slaughtering sheep after they had past their most productive wool producing years. Uh, we find sheep shears. We, the bottom line is we find a, a lot of evidence of self-sustained cottage industry there, that, that he was self-sustained there. The second thing, you know, a lot of stories talk about him being a loner up there, and we definitely see different signs of engagement with others, whether it's all sorts of children's toys, marbles, a little ceramic teacup, a puzzle piece, or even tins of white makeup. And let me tell you that there are those moments <laughs> as an archaeologist where you find something and you're almost speechless. What what Nathan Harrison was doing with the tin of white makeup is still yeah. a mystery to me. And and I love it. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the fun of archaeology is finding something and you know, all the students are looking at you and you realize, 
oh man, not only do I not have any idea, I can't even fake like I know what's going on at this point. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's, that's what I love about archaeology is even at a site where you've been digging for a while and you think, oh, I got a good handle on this. Then you find something and you realize, I have no idea what's next. Um, and, and so, and so there, there are a lot of, of myths out there that, you know, that, that I, I still want to learn more about in terms of, you know, was there any tie to his mining days in Northern California in his life in Southern California? There are so many stories about the stash of gold that he had on his property. And, you know, at, at every archaeology site, every public archaeology site, we're always asked, have you found any gold yet? And we get really annoyed mm-hmm. and we say, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> you know, it's that and dinosaur bones are the questions that, you know, never really yep. thrill us. And yet, yeah, I'd love to find Harrison's gold. That would be fantastic, you know, to to wonder if he had some some tie to his mining days in Northern California or there was a gold rush in nearby Julian as well. Um, and we dug this one area of the site well to the south that was rumored to be a stash where his gold was. Uh, but that ended up being the Arastra, the area where he had a mule that was used to, to grind ore. Um, so, you know, simple answer to your question. Yeah, there, there are lots of things we're still trying to unravel with this in terms of the, the famous stories. But at the same time, we have some great resolution on some of the the key issues. I think one of my favorite artifacts was finding a camera lens at the site. And the reason I love Hmm. this so much is that Harrison is the most photographed 19th century San Diego. Uh, Wyatt Earp lived in San Diego. We have more photographs of Harrison than Wyatt Earp. And these photographs are a really (laughs) important statement because, you know, these aren't Frederick Douglass photographs. He's not, He's not defiant. He's not projecting independence. He's, he's doing his act. You know, he's got on the torn up clothing. He's non-threatening. He's usually pictured with a dog or some other walking stick that, that implies friendliness and engagement. Um, and to find a little camera lens from those first Brownie Kodak cameras was so fun to be able to connect the dots like that. Did he take a lot of his own? Photos too? I mean, did he take, not photos of himself, but he, is there any evidence that he actually took photos and do we have those? No, we don't. And t- he had two friends that were photographers. So I think that, you know, ah, okay. when I talk about multiple interpretations, the, the photos are a great example of this. Why are there so many photos of him? Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think part of it is this was San Diego's first tourism destination. Um, the city started to grow. The, ra- the railroad was finally connected to San Diego in the 1880s. The city grows and white tourists wanting to see the antebellum south, wanting to see nature, they go on this three-day trip to the top of Palmar Mountain and he is the attraction. And so, you know, Hmm. why are there all these photos? Well, one is this tourism trip. Two is it was was a real challenge to see if these early automobiles could make it up the the mountain uh, it was often advertised in the early automobile magazines you know the the same way if if you go to paris you got to take a picture of the eiffel tower to show that you made it you go to palomar mountain you got to get a picture of harrison to show that you made it and so th- there's some face and then and then he was good friends with two photographers who took a lot of photos that's a reason for it but then you can also get at these these deeper issues and realize you know, he knew what he was doing with these photographs. He was giving people something to take home with them that established that as his territory. One, one of the most important things about the landscape of this site is that Harrison was given the land by the local native population and he homesteaded it. And this, hmm. this really sunk into me. I was at an event uh, for the Presidio a couple of years ago. And it was very volatile. They were honor, honoring the Spanish settlers and there were Kumeyaay protesters there. The police had to be called. It was, it was a very difficult event for, for everyone involved. And it was all about colonial history and reparations and just how upset folks are on, on all the different issues. Mm-hmm. And I was sitting there and it was, it was funny. As I was at this event, I didn't sit down. I didn't want to pick a side. I didn't want to, to, to ally with, with either group because it was so polarizing and people were being so nasty to each other. And I was walking down the hill and I was thinking to myself, 
you know, we got lots of issues with the Harrison site. You know, somebody using the N-word, that immediately sets off many audiences. Yeah. But one thing we don't have with this site was contention over whose land it was. So the, the indigenous population gives him the land, but he still lets them use their trails for their seasonal homes at the top of the mountain. And he builds his cabin at this intersection between the most prominent Native American trail and the county road. I mean, it's this brilliant location where he's going to intersect with both of those. And oh yeah, he also has this caveat because it takes three days to get up to his house. He can see you coming for hours and hours in advance. And if he doesn't want to engage with you, he's gone. And so, and so that's where, that's where for me, I got to see, you know, all these different interpretations of what can seem so seemingly simple, like why so many photos and yeah. I, I want us to allow room for all those interpretations. So one of the things that I've been thinking about, both reading your book and just in general, is kind of two points um, that I think we work with a lot in historical archaeology, which is this interplay between the archaeological materials and archival materials and how our reading of one often affects our reading of the others. So I've been really fascinated by this interplay between the archaeological materials we work with, these archival materials, and how they end up changing our interpretation of each other. So we look at if we look at either set independently, we come up with yeah. one narrative story. But when we bring them into dialogue with each other and we sort of shift between them, how readings of both start to alter. So, you know, thinking about all the issues around Harrison's self-presentation, when you see these visual images of him and then you see the archaeological evidence, all of a sudden that reading changes and you see the agency behind the photos in a way that you haven't before and sort of shifting this outward into the community that you've been talking about and thinking about how our archaeological work, you know, we work often with communities as historical archaeologists. Yeah. We're asking them for materials. We're asking them for their narratives about historical events or people. But then in our own research, sometimes we're challenging their idea of community <laughs> and community history um, and how this has played out in this project, in part because it has these intense sort of racial undertones to it. And ideas yeah. of, uh, you know, racialized past. Yeah, it, it's such a great issue because when you do have that interplay between artifacts and records, it's this explosion of narratives. You know, it's it's no longer an A versus B. It's it's the whole alphabet. And with, with Harrison, it gets so complicated because there's so many different ethnic groups involved. And then there's also rural and urban. You know, something we haven't talked about is he is this mythical character. He's this hero on the mountain. But when he is forced to go to the hospital because he's sick during the last year of his life, he's lost and forgotten in the city of San Diego, and he's put in an unmarked grave. And, and that's where you get to see the, the context that makes a hero, that makes a myth. If that gets removed, uh, suddenly it, it, the image is shattered. Um, and, and that's where you know I, I find myself getting pulled all over San Diego County and all these different audiences and stakeholders trying to figure this out. And what's so fun about this is we're in the final stages of creating a large year long exhibit in Balboa park on this project. And it's that chance to not only show off the artifacts and the records and the myths, but to have people be part of our interpretive process. And it, it is so difficult because this story can be told in so many different ways. And we, we want to give people the freedom to find their own story in this and be interactive, but we also still want to be tethered to this notion of accuracy. You know, the, there are falsehoods out there and there are ways that we know certain things are false. Um, and so we, we go back and forth on exactly how to design this. And so now the, the overall layout of this large year-long exhibit is it's a trek up the mountain. 
and you actually start by sitting in an old vehicle and turn the ignition and you get to watch this we videotape driving up the bumpy mountain road and then you get to walk through these along this different path and on that path you see an exhibit for the 1850s and statehood and the gold rush you get the 1860s and the civil war the 1870s and the gilded age and you get to see harrison's story and also the story of race relations um told in a very different way, not the traditional uh, everything's wonderful in California way, but in this very raw and authentic way. And then you make it to the cabin and that's where you get to see the, the double life. That really is the, the, the big moment where it all comes together. Um, and then there's an entirely separate room that's all about the archaeological process. Um, it's, I've, I've never undertaken something like this before. You know, we, we did have a, when we, do still have a, a great museum at Jamestown, the Archaearium, on the on the excavation. But this one's different. You know, the, the Jamestown story is told in a much more singular fashion. Yeah, it's impossible to tell the Harrison story in a singular fashion. Um, and and that's where I've decided to embrace that. <laughs> you, you can <laughs> you can say I've admitted defeat, or I'm just celebrating. Um, all the different stories that get brought up through these artifacts, through different oral histories, through written accounts. And, and I want others to celebrate that multiplicity too. So what questions are remaining that you want to explore here in the future about uh, Nay Harrison? Is there more uh, archeological work to be done, more excavation? Uh, what, what's it look like? Yeah. So we're going to be digging there this summer that we like to say that the, the year 2020 is the year of Harrison. It's the, the hundred year <laughs> anniversary of his passing. So we have, we have a bunch of things scheduled. Uh, the, the book drops and then the exhibit opens in the spring and then I'll be digging this June doing my, my field school. We're going to, maybe you guys can help me on the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> IT and AV front. We're going to do a live feed from the dig. Uh, ah which is a little terrifying for me, but at the same time, I think it'll, it, it's so <laughs> tough to get to the site that that gives all the people in the region a way to, to follow the dig. And, and, you know, people watch the fishing challenge, uh, the fishing channel and, and fishing and archeology span remind me of a similar endeavor in that you can't try harder and find more. It just, you know, <laughs> is. Yeah. Um, and then in October, we're going to have a ceremony at his grave site the one that was an unmarked grave that is now marked to celebrate the centennial. And I, I'm trying to convince the mayor to make it Nathan Harrison day. Uh, but to get to your specific question about, all right, what more to find uh, mm -hmm. at the end of last season, I thought I knew what was going on. It was all making sense. And then on the last day, and I know this sounds cliche, but it was really true on the last <laughs> day, the last hour, a student found a rifle powder canister made of zinc and tin, a scallop design. I mean, th this is a Civil War artifact. This is, this is, you know, we're finding all these rifle cartridges, but this is gunpowder, uh, you know, holster mm -hmm. for gunpowder. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't think anyone's found anything like this in San Diego before. And it hmm. just, it, it opens up that big question is, to this point, the site dates from about 1865 to 1920. But that doesn't mean we found the earliest component to it. Right. And so th th there was, you know, you know, the insecurities that crawl into our archaeological ears. <laughs> oh, Lord, what if I've missed the early part of the site? <laughs> um, and, and that's where this mountain has gets a ton of rain, a ton of snow. Um, we've had fires on it before. And all of those things expose new areas. And, and that's where I've seen new scatters of artifacts. You know, I, I am trying to wrap things up. But I'm not very good at that. Uh, maybe that's just the nature of archaeology. Uh, but it's it's been fun. And and the other thing is is there just aren't too many field schools out here in Southern California, and yet there's a ton of CRM archaeology. I mean, you, you think mm -hmm. about this irony because there's so much development. There are 50 yeah. different CRM firms working in Southern California, and we need to train those folks. And the first thing the CRM companies ask you know their applicants out here is, do you have a field school? And so I, I feel very tied. I think that's one of my most important jobs is to help give people experience doing real archaeology. Um, so, so the the project continues, um, and it it is on private land. I know you guys talked to Vicki Morgan before. She's a dear friend. She's the owner of the property, and she has decided that 
instead of making this a private property that's sealed off and has keep out signs all over it, that she's going to make it a bed and breakfast and she's going to celebrate the history and the natural beauty. And it's about getting people up to that area to see it. So we have a mm-hmm. new model that we're trying to, to that it becomes a, a community center that becomes about public engagement while also protecting the site. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Well, that's all the time we have. Um, Dr. Seth Malios, thanks for coming on the Archaeology Show and telling us about this fascinating her- history of this uh, amazing individual. Thanks so much for having me. All right. And hopefully we can have you back on at some point in the future when uh, when more secrets are revealed. So we'll discuss those possibilities and bring you some more amazing content. And we have a couple more um, good interviews coming up on the Archaeology Show. So stay tuned for that. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this show, check out all the other fantastic shows on the Archaeology Podcast Network, our over 3,000 back catalog episodes. And if you're interested, go become a member at arcpodnet.com forward slash members and help us out over here and to keep the lights on and, and keep this whole thing going. All right. Thank you, Dr. Malios. And thank you, April. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Archaeology Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. You can provide feedback using the contact button on the right side of the website at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash archaeology. Or you can email chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Please like and share the show wherever you saw it so more people can have a chance to listen and learn. Send us show suggestions and follow ArcPodNet on Twitter and Instagram. This show was produced by the Archaeology Podcast Network. Opinions are solely those of the hosts and guests of the show. However, the APN stands by their hosts. Special thanks to the band Sea Hero for letting us use their song, I Wish You'd Look. Check out their albums on Bandcamp at seahero.bandcamp.com. Check out our next episode in two weeks. And in the meantime, keep learning. Keep discovering new things and keep listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Have an awesome day. This show is produced and recorded by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle in Reno, Nevada at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.